Hi, everyone. I'm Kawa, and this is yet another conduct conversation. Uh, to use Alexi's excellent model uh, yesterday on what it means to be a person who cares about procedural generation, my personal identity is that I am a ranger of metabardness. What does this mean in practice? I understand the wild depths of the world can help you navigate it and make sense of it through the weirdness and the creativity that you all create on a regular basis. Um, so I have been the host of a podcast called Roguelike Radio about design, about uh, Procgen, about developer interviews, about all sorts of stuff. I used to do um, Let's Plays and streams about these games, uh, most notably a series called exploring the ASCII dungeon about UI choices using ASCII games. So all of those past conversations you just had uh, this morning, feel free to uh, compare and contrast. As Noah mentioned, in 2016, I had a whole bunch of us in Brooklyn eating snacks and talking about Dijkstra maps. And when I make my own procedural generator, a, a lovely little Twitter bot, at bot finds, it is literally an homage to one of the best weird procedural generations out there, a uh, lovely little zen simulator called Robot Loves Kitten. So clearly, this is my home. This is my community. I love you all very much. And so in light of that, well, what does a ranger have to do? A ranger has to know the world, know what's out there, gather all the information. And so I've spent lots and lots of time reading through guides other people have made for these games, partly okay, I'm also bad at them. Uh, like, let's just be really honest. You can watch my talk from last year about being so bad that I talked about failure. Um, but really, I wanted to know more about the structures of these worlds, about how the mechanics all fit together, so I would pick up all of these different places. And besides the actual tips and tricks and how to create characters and all of that useful stuff, I'd also run into this really interesting sidebars about people who took these really hard games and then made them even harder by adding extra constraints on what they were doing in them. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Why those are here, why, why those happen, show some history of what these have looked like in a couple of different places in roguelike culture, uh, celebrate how creative you all have been, developers and players alike, and give some food for thought on what these ki this kind of play means for mechanics and for balance. So, um, those are my goals, but this is how I plan to do it. Um, I'm gonna give you a starting definition of generally what I mean when I say conduct play. Uh, four examples from three games for some compare and contrast in history, and a final thought a little more philosophical on what games are, what toys are, and why, why that matters, and a definition to end what conducts are based on those facts. So, the first um, thing is, well, a, a starting definition. Conduct play in general, I'm gonna talk about as a style of playing a game that deliberately changes the rules of the game from what seems to be initially stated. They're usually harder than the standard game. That's what they're generally here for. And some of these are things that players came up with and others are done with tracked inside the game, within the game. Um, obviously, in our modern world, this is usually known as achievements. But there are other ways, too, and we'll get into that and some interesting notes I found in that world. So let's start with Ancient Domains of Mystery. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for your, your talk. The original Adom is an extremely long and complicated game, as he mentioned. It is one of my first loves. I care about it so much. This is a rendition of the original map. There's like 20 locations on this thing, and some of them have caves inside the caves and side areas. It's insane. It's wonderful. Um, and so you have to explore through a lot of these places, and you know some of them are more dangerous than others. Some of them do more than others. Um, but in general, you're gonna see most of this map over the course of the game. That's a lot of time and energy to be putting into a run, to be putting into beating the game for whatever that means to you. 
One of those locations is known as the small cave. You can access it right away. It's actually not hard to miss. All you get when you start is a scroll that says time is working against you, another scroll with a little piece of information, and that's kind of it. So what this really is, and I'm sorry to spoil this slightly, um, the monsters in this particular setting grow more powerful, let me pull that back. You kill monsters, new monsters appear. Those new monsters are much more powerful than the ones you just killed, and it grows at a rate that gets really out of control. Now, there's some useful things in this cave, and it's also a useful shortcut to other places. So the usual way to do this is, you know, run in, kill as little as possible, get what you need, and get out. That's what you're kind of intended to do, to sort of prove to you that you don't have to use combat to get what you need. Yet some people do this anyway. Not only do they do this anyway, they literally say, go to the small cave, see if you can get to maximum level, and that's it. That's the entire challenge. Um, it, and this challenge is known as Eternium Man, Eternium being a very, um, a very precious and rare and difficult to get and strong metal within the realm of, of the game. So it asks some interest, the fact that the challenge exists and the fact that some people have actually done it implies some really strange things, doesn't it? What does it mean at, as a player to survive in a space that you weren't meant to try to survive in? And also, at the same time, while this is really hard, obviously, it's also technically faster than the main game. There's only one place to go, there's only one goal, there's none of this running around, you know, helping unicorns and, you know, killing, killing bandits and whatever. It's all just in one little place, in one little cave the size of your terminal. But it tests the limits of a player's combat knowledge anyway. Um, so this and other challenges were really common um, in the community. The earliest reference I was able to find was around the year 2000, and there's a couple from the late 90s. I had a lot of trouble searching for why these things got named these ways, where these came from. Please help me find this information out. Um, I really want to know who thought these up, where they came from. Um, I found this old Angel Fire site that tracked a bunch of these. Uh, yes, Angel Fire. <laughs> True 90s kids remember. Um, but it, you know, I don't know the story and all of, and you know, all of the email addresses linked to dead domains. Help me out here. Um, and meanwhile, while that was happening on the ancient domains of mystery side, let's talk about NetHack, which obviously was another one of the major roguelikes of that time period. Uh, this table, for those who can't read it, is basically all of the scrolls that you can get in NetHack. Um, Really, all you need to know is that NetHack is filled to the brim with items. Some of them are outright harmful. There's a scroll of amnesia where if you read it, you will literally forget those skills you worked so hard to learn. Um, or they could be incredibly useful. The scroll of genocide that could help you get rid of mind flayers forever. Um, and so Net since NetHack's item generation is so random and so complex, you could easily see a scenario where you want to get rid of your bad items and get some good ones instead. Luckily, there's an item for that. Polymorph your trash today. One of these wands is, has a chance of being the wand of polymorph. And the wand of polymorph, when zapped on a bunch of items, will turn those items into other items. And maybe those items will be useful. And when you run out of uh, charges on the wand of polymorph, maybe some of those items you got before will help you recharge the wand of polymorph so you can do this over again. Cool, right? Great, amazing. Here's the thing though, how am I gonna get lots of items? Well, we can make lots of trash. How would we make lots of trash? Well, we could kill lots of monsters. It would be great to have a monster that, you know, we could kill but also have the choice of either killing or making more of that would drop some stuff and make more and drop some more and make some more and drop some more. This is really tedious. 
this is really terrible. But also, like, technically, if you did this long enough, if you cared to do this long enough, you could keep doing this over and over and over again into forever, maybe get an infinite wish engine or something out of it. I don't know. You could just keep doing this and get everything you need for your ascension kit and then some and completely break the game if you're willing to sit through, slashing through, all these delicious, terrible puddings. So let's never do that again. And so um, one of NetHack's conducts um, is called polypile -less, uh, casually. It, it, I think the official wording is has never polymorphed an item. And the thing is, this conduct is relatively easy. Um, roughly 42% of everyone who has won on one of NetHack's public servers hasn't needed to bother with doing this at all. So why is this mechanic in the game? Well, because NetHack. That's why we love it. But it, it has this implication that like this horribly broken and tedious thing no one even wants to bother with. And pudding farming itself was actually nerfed quite severely. The puddings no long, uh, split puddings no longer drop loot, if I remember correctly, as of 2015. Oh, and by the way, um, I did just say 2015 and NetHack. So um, if someone tells you that NetHack is an old game, you can tell them, no, it was updated in the last few years. It is a modern game, because it is. Um, so, um, but yes, yeah, so, Speaking of um, this tracking, that 42% of all winning accounts on, on NetHack all org are polypile lists, way back in 1999, um, the uh, extended command conduct was added to NetHack itself. I would like to note that this was in December 1999. This is two year, at least three years before Xbox tracked achievements on Xbox Live. This is well before 2007 Orange Box on Steam when Steve added and when Steam added achievements. So way before, you know, somewhere between Activision patches in the 80s for you know taking pictures of your screen and the modern achievement system as we know it, NetHack had an in-game way to track specific conducts. Um, this screen is actually not the NetHack uh, screen. It's actually for a related game known as Slashem. Super lots of added, ex uh, super lots of added stuff hack with extended magic because NetHack didn't have enough going for it apparently. And this actually has more. Um, this is um, terminal into um, a Slashem server as of a few weeks ago. So there's even more than. Um, more conducts in here than in uh, vanilla NetHack, which has 10. Um, the thing I wasn't able to find, and again, help me find this stuff, the history is important, is why those 10 conducts, including polypile lists, were considered the conducts to be tracked officially in game. We know that there were other things going on, such as Zen, that weren't officially tracked in game, and that we, there are clearly other uh, conducts that Slashem chose to um, do and NetHack didn't. What were the conversations around that? What was going on? I don't know why I can't search Usenet like a power user. Someone help me out here. Um, I would like to also note this one hilarious thing from the release notes of um, NetHack. Um, 330 from December 99 when they first released this conduct concept. How about prompting the player before they break a conduct? No, the whole point of conduct is that you're avoiding the kind of actions that lead to, to violations. The debt and team are jerks sometimes. They think of everything, but also they consciously don't think of the things they consciously don't think of. <laughs> and so let's fast forward uh, many years later, Hoplite which is a lovely, lovely mobile, ro uh, very tactical roguelike. Um, and it has this really cool um, concept where you start with three basic skills, uh, a lunge, a jump, and a shield bash. And in its standard mode, each level, you have the chance to go to an altar, and you have the chance to get a gift. You choose one of the gifts from the list that the god is willing to give you. Um, and they, inc they increase the capability of those standard skills or give you more health, as you can see here. What Hoplite then does is 
pull that mechanic apart in two very separate ways for two very separate challenges. On the one hand, it will track in that NetHack style conduct screen way, hey, you didn't actually touch any of those alters. They're technically optional. They don't feel like it because the game is that hard, but they are. And there are people who have finished the game without touching them. This is actually um, from a YouTube run that not only did that, never actually got hurt in the game, which I don't understand it. I, I, I watched this slack jawed, I, incredible. Anyway, uh, so there's that. And then on the other side, there is also a daily challenge with three extremely difficult levels, an arbitrary set of skills, and it says, can you survive? It almost does the, the Eternium Man style, here's really hard combat, go for it. And it does both of these officially within a, a cute little iOS Android game. So I think there's so much room within any given play space for people to examine their mechanics, pull them apart, create challenges from them, and I find that really inspiring. So, this brings me to my bigger point. I promised you stuff about games and toys. Toys, objects of play. You can mess around with Legos, you can build stuff, you can knock them down. There's not really a way to win or lose at Legos. I mean, maybe, but also, no. And games, well, oh good. We won. It would have been so awful if we had lost the game. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. Games have win conditions and loss conditions. We turn toys into games by, give, by asking, can you do this skill with this toy? If you succeed, you're closer to winning. If you don't succeed, you're closer to losing. Um, so, you know, a ball is a toy. Being able to catch a ball, skill. Being able to catch a ball under certain circumstances and do certain things, a game. But the thing is, over time, people get good at those basic things, and well, then they have to refine those rules and make those rules more challenging and make those rules more interesting and define things more c clearly, I guess. Uh, this is completely unrelated to procedural generation except for the fact that it isn't. Um, this is John Boyce, who is your favorite sports writer, even if you don't know it yet, um, writing about what the heck a catch is in American football. It's much more than it sounds like it is, but I'm not going to spoil it for you. So please, just, just check it out. Um, and so we see this all the time in games that we call sandboxes. A, sa a literal sandbox is a literal toy, right? It is a box with sand in it, you can make stuff in it, but there's no win condition as a sandbox. The win condition is in Dwarf Fortress is basically, can you make cool things happen and mostly not have the, the dwarves die? Unless you want to watch the dwarves die, I guess. Um, so like this particular uh, one is a, a player who decided to build a fort out in the middle of the ocean by taking advantage of the ice physics of, of, of Dwarf Fortress. I don't understand how people do it. I, I love this community. <laughs> That's really all I have to say about it. But by creating that artificial constraint of can I build on the ice, suddenly uh, you have a really compelling victory condition and a really compelling game and a really compelling series uh, by Krug Smash. That's worth checking out too. So to bring this back to the general idea of conduct, um, being good at a game is a skill, just as any of those other skills about throwing or catching or building or knocking things down. Once the skill is at mastered enough, well, you add new rules to keep the game interesting and exciting. Somehow, roguelike players are dedicated enough to be good at games that throw them randomness all the time. So creating these conducts for these games is using the mechanics as its own toy for refined and advanced gameplay. Um, the whole idea of, well, what if I toss out this mechanic? Is it easier or harder? What if, I, what if I try to do it in this way? Is it easier or harder? Does it make it more interesting? Is it challenging my skills in different ways? Those are the things that, that players are examining when they're looking at what conducts are. So, some final takeaways. First off, please help me preserve and celebrate roguelike history. Um, 
I mentioned the questions I have about ancient domains of mystery and NetHack and Slashem. Um, if any of you in the audience know or have leads, let me know. If you all know how to actually search Usenet like a power user instead of fumbling through Google groups and sobbing because you can't actually, you know, get to before 1999 uh, easily, please tell me. Uh, um, and for developers, what mechanics in your games are easy to ignore or hard to ignore? What do the, what does tweaking and changing those mechanics like a like a like a high level player imply for your game as a whole? And what skills are you asking for when you ask a player to be good at a game? And as a player who interacts deeply with the mechanics of a game, how can you do that further? What, what more can you do to keep that game interesting and keep that game culture alive? Thank you. Hey. Okay, we have time for some questions, if people have any. Hi, great talk. Uh, it's you. kind of like a softball, but what's your favorite conduct? I'm just really curious. Any game. Oh, man. Hard question. Favorites. Um, so my favorite conduct is only, it is kind of, Related and unrelated to this general idea, in Dungeon and Crawl Stone Soup, every six months there's a tournament of, of players trying the new build. And every time they randomly generate a species background combo, a race class combo, but for Stone Soup. And so it's, can you beat the game under these like randomized constraints? The first eight players to get it get the tro get a trophy, and then they switch to the next one and switch to the next one to weirder and weirder combinations that no sane person should actually be combining. But people do it all the time. Like, just, it's insane. It's ridiculous. I also love, there are a handful of people who have beaten NetHack with all 10 of the standard um, conducts. And so, you know, I, I know of one person who, for like three months afterwards, was like, you should do the thing. Can't just did a 10 conduct ascension. You know, like, <laughs> just absolutely masterful. <laughs> uh, great, great talk. Um, uh, what's, can, can you name some examples of conducts that feel the most perversely and possibly humorously against the spirit of the basic game design. Because I'm thinking back to uh, in, in Doom's early history, people would do these uh, pacifist runs or just, you know, minimally trying to, you know, not harm the demons or something. And, you know, it's just so clearly counter to the purpose of the game, whereas a game with a much wider set of player expression, I don't know, I'm curious as to what, you, what you've run across. I mean, definitely, uh, um, definitely, pacifist in most traditional roguelikes is really, really absurd. There is a, an Ancient Domains of Mystery one where um, you're, you have the chance of starting a character with a certain kind of breath. You're a drakeling, so you part dragon, and you have this auxiliary uh, dragon breath. And there's at least one person who has beaten the game using only that. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that to yourself? And yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, great talk. Um, I wanted to say my favorite in ADOM, which is, I don't know how you, how it was done, is completing the game only being able to carry 100 units worth of inventory. The oh, chaos yes. orbs weigh 100, so yes. you cannot have any food, you cannot have any armor, and you can only carry one of them at a time. Yes. So and that, and that has been beaten. <laughs> and, and and that means you have to get a whole bunch of things past uh, a particularly evil mini boss without anything at all, ever, or food. Yeah, no, it's, yes, the uh, the 100 stone, yeah, that's correct. I, wow, <laughs> people are amazing. <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering if you find any other, like, driving motivations for conducts other than challenge. Like, are there, like, primarily role-playing motivated, or like, do do those community cohere around any of those, do you find? Um, well, definitely the Dwarf Fortress one was very much a, um, 
of role-playing one almost. It, it wanted to tell a specific story about these specific dwarves doing the specific crazed quest and, and really leaned into that uh, very thoroughly. There's definitely also a level of just plain removing tedium as I sort of brought up with the poly pile. Like it's a mechanic that exists, it can help you win, but you actually don't need it because God, it's awful, seriously. Just say no to puddings. <laughs> I think there was one in the front. Um, I'll ask one as I walk over there. Sure. Uh, is there any evidence for developers changing things about their games uh, in response to conduct? I'm thinking a lot about the NetHack vegetarian and vegan conduct, and maybe they add different things. I, I, I think there's been some. Um, certainly the whole removing pudding farming in NetHack in 2015 was clearly a response to people really abusing mechanics in certain ways. Um, I, I, and yes, things like food balance for you know vegetarian and vegan conducts. In the not roguelike community, I do see a lot of people making games specifically to be speedrun, which I think is adjacent to, but not exactly this, where they, you know, things like Celeste making things very accessible in certain ways to make sure that players can do certain things to play the game faster. Um, I would love more evidence of like how conducts influence uh, developer behavior. So talk to me after about that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that one one of the um, one of the things about conducts is that they're almost always intended to make the game harder. Do you have any examples offhand of conduct that makes the game easier? Um, the the clearest ones I can think of are sort of like only sticking to a specific weapon or a specific subset of skills to sort of bring down the, the, the decision tree to something very specific. Um, or, you know, cr like just plain ignoring mechanics that give you more choice in a lot of cases. I think crawl, like, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, never leaving one god for another. It's a thing you can do and it can be very powerful for certain cases, but most players aren't going to bother with it because there is a sort of in the moment um, penalty for trying. So stuff like that, I think. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.